Greetings, this is Mike Grain. Welcome to another edition of the Walton Supply Chain Center, focusing on on-shelf availability. Today, I get the chance to kind of share my ideas and my thoughts on the state of the industry as it relates to on-shelf availability. I've got a couple of clips from this year's uh, particular podcast, but really it's focusing on what are the different people, processes, and technology to be able to look at on-shelf availability and make improvements. Let's get started. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's a beautiful day in Bentonville, Arkansas. We're so glad you're here today as Mike Grain continues his on-shelf availability series. Today, he's going to focus on uh, what he's calling a 2020, uh, 2023 state of the industry. Uh, we've got a big group that is uh, going to be joining us. We've got more than 350 people that have been um, registered and invited. So uh, we're, we're glad that you're all here. This, uh, this series that Mike launched with us uh, more than a year ago now is presented by the University of Arkansas, which has the number one undergraduate supply chain program for the second year in a row. You can learn more about that at walton.uark.edu. And we've got some great sponsors that have been great uh, to, to work with, including BrainCorp, uh, Barcoding, SES on Magatag, and uh, our friends at BOPS. Mike and I are excited to uh, announce today a gathering place and resource center that we have created for the industry to come together to discover uh, industry expertise, best in class solutions, as well as thought leadership. So as we wrap up today, we'd appreciate you take a look at onshelfavailability.com. You'll hear us talking about that more in the days and weeks to come. And in case you missed it, one of the things that you're going to find on onshelfavailability.com is sort of an archive of all of the conversations that Mike has been hosting. Uh, to date. So again, we encourage you to look under thought leadership at onshelfavailability.com. A reminder that this is a conversation. It's intended to be a conversation and not a presentation. And we would love to you to uh, love for you to join us and actively participate. And the best way to do that is just to click on the Q&A button at any point during the, the, the presentation, the conversation today. Use that Q&A button uh, in Zoom to submit your questions, your comments in writing. Uh, one of the things that we always like to share is uh, from a compliance perspective, it's really important that we comply with all federal antitrust laws. So we'll be refraining from talking about anything related to pricing, uh, margins, discounts, suppliers, timing of price changes, et cetera. And the last thing is the opinions and recommendations that are expressed uh, by, um, by the experts leading and participating in these discussions are solely their own and not necessarily those of conversations on retail. And we encourage you before acting on those opinions or recommendations uh, to always consider their suitability for your circumstances. So with all of that said, we're so glad that you're here. Mike, let's get started. Awesome. Well, Matt, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon to everybody who is uh, on the podcast. Uh, Matt doesn't like to call it a podcast. He likes to call it a conversation. And uh, it is uh, it is certainly good to be back with you guys again. Uh, Matt, we've kind of been reflecting on this. To make it a conversation, I think it's going to be you and I having a conversation as we sort of work through these various topics and uh, the folks uh, on the line, please, we encourage you, if you have any questions at all, to go ahead and uh, raise your hand and uh, ask it via the Q&A chat function. And Matt will be able to secure those and, and forward them through. So um, first and foremost, we've been doing this for about a year. And um, you know, what I thought I'd, I'd do is as we begin the second year uh, of, of going into these topics, we've talked about a lot of interesting things of availability. A lot more research has come out uh, post-COVID, so I'm going to kind of update you on some of those kinds of uh, activities. And also some new capabilities have become available. Um, so we want to definitely ju jump into this and uh, start to talk about a little bit of what, what the opportunities are. The good news um, is for those people who are trying to solve the on-shelf availability problem, it's still out there. <laughs> uh, we had a breakfast this morning and we, we talked a little bit about on-shelf availability. And one of the guys who's been in re retail for a long time said, the great thing about OSA is it was here 50, 60, 70 years ago, and it'll be here 70 years later. It's something you're always working on. It's things you're trying to continue to improve to make sure that you have product available for the customer. So uh, what do you, one of the things that we want to start with is basically, you know, I love this Sam Wong quote. He, he did this one years ago. Uh, Doug McMillan from uh, Walmart has a similar quote, but it's there's only one boss, the customer, and they can fire everyone in the company from the chairman on down simply by spending his or her money somewhere else. And I think that's very well said back when Sam Walton was running retail, and it's still the case today. Customers have more choices than ever, 
everybody's walking around with basically a computer in their hand where they can literally order stuff anytime they want to and have it delivered to their house. So the power is really in the customer, whether they're brand loyal or retailer loyal, they they have choices that they can go to. Uh, so the, the, uh, the other piece of this is I, I think the other piece that I think is really important is some facts that were produced by the IHL group. Some of you may have seen this before, but some of these sound bites are really, really important from my perspective. Retailers are missing out on a trillion dollars in sales, a trillion dollars in sales. Amazon Prime customers facing empty shelves are 52% more likely than other consumers to take out their phones and buy what they need online. I don't know about you, but I've been a victim of that. I've gone into stores, tried to buy something. It's not there. A, a specific printer cartridge or something specifically, you know, a specific item that I'm looking for, they don't have. I am very, uh, very apt to pull out my phone and use that cut that retailer's Wi-Fi to order that product from an Amazon or somebody else. So I'm basically using the retailer Wi-Fi to order from a competitor. I'm not proud of it, but I came all the way to the store to get it. I I, I got to have that particular product that's really necessary for what I'm trying to do. And the last one is 24% of Amazon's current retail growth came from re- from customers who tried to buy it in a store first. I think those are pretty amazing. Um, a couple of things that I think are, are also trend. These are this is relatively new from Shop uh, Shopkick Chain Store Age. Um, is eighty one percent of the shoppers have noticed more shelves are out of stock or are lower stock than usual in retailers than a few few years ago. When when you start to highlight uh, some of the areas, whoops, I'm sorry. Um, there there we go. When you start to, to to unpack a little bit about what those particular items are. You see things like meat products, dairy products, box food, canned foods, et cetera. You also see what I kind of mentioned before, which is brand loyalty is wavering. 65% of the consumers said they would buy the next best option if their go-to brands are sold out in low stock. And 59% said, 59% said they would be willing to go to a new brand and do it regularly. Um, I am not a shopper, consumer shopper expert. There are people on the line, like our friends at Field Agent, that are better at doing this kind of research for sure, but I'm sure this varies by category, but the bottom line, it goes back to the customer, go back to Sam Walton's quote, they're ultimately the boss. They're gonna choose to get what they want, where they want it, and uh, you know, if we don't have it available for them, they'll, have, they'll find other options. So one of the things, Matt, I, I wanted to ask you, which is you know, this particular picture here, we're, we'll talk a little bit about Walmart because we're both kind of you know, have some experience working at Walmart, working with the, the CPG suppliers who work with Walmart, et cetera. But as you look at this picture, there's there's a lady obviously leaving the store. When you think about this thing called Walmart, what do you think about? The place that I can go to buy almost anything that I need. Almost anything that you need. Exactly right. And I think for years, that's what it has been. And most retailers, retailers have been. Uh, I would also argue that it's also becoming a fulfillment center. Because you have, and I remember the statistics, it was something like 90 or 95% of the U.S. population uh, lives within 10 miles of a Walmart store. That's pretty hard to beat. So literally, it's not, I get to order it and I get it in two days. I literally can order it and get it within hours, okay? Uh, and being able to, to be both a traditional retail store and a fulfillment center that allows you to digitally order product where you want it, et cetera. And they're not the only ones. All of these footprints, all these retailers, and many, many more uh, have the same thing. So, customers, uh, shoppers have more choices than ever. Retailers have the uh, have continue to have issues with on shelf availability and supply chain and things like that. And what this is, this particular conference is all about, is our, our discussion is to talk about what are some of the ways you can a measure it and and b improve it. A couple of other more sound bites here. Um, this is something from, from the e-marketer folks. I've shared this uh, in a previous conference as well. These are the percentage of retail sales that are being done through an e-commerce platform. And you see it's only 15% of the total U.S. or total business. But in some of these categories, like apparel, it's almost 38%. Uh, you see toys and hobby, you see 45%. Books, music, video, obviously that's a big one with 69 uh, So. These particular things, people are using digital tools to do either research online and picking it up in store or buying it online or picking it up in store or regular fulfillment, ordering it online and having it delivered to your home. And uh, this is a this is a graph uh, that we used a, a while back, which shows 
just the retailers and how their growth is. And this happened to be in the electronics category. But Matt, you see this big blue line here. Any idea who that big blue line is, which is going from 9.3 to 41.26? That looks a lot like Amazon. It sure does. And it looks like a lot of other retailers are growing in the electronics category as well, but not nearly as fast as Amazon. So the question becomes, okay, how do you how do you compete with a fulfillment, which is something like Amazon, which have that broad assortment? I would argue really, really simple user interface. If my father, who's 85, can order stuff on Amazon and have it delivered to his home when he struggles with basic email and texting sometimes, um, their, their, their site is certainly very easy to navigate. And they obviously have the convenience factor as well. So that's, that's the thing. You got to have it on shelf. These particular stores are becoming fulfillment centers. Now, Here's a couple of things that I think would be interesting. Matt, we've got a we've got a video or, or a uh, screen snapshot of Target with Wrangler jeans. Um, and then I've got the same thing from a few years ago from Walmart. So this one's the Target one. That one's the Walmart one. You see anything different about the two? That's uh, Walmart? Yeah. The right. price, dif- price difference jumps out. Okay. So Target's at $19.99. Walmart's at $18.87. Yep. Anything else that you see that jumps out as a big aha or difference? Looks like Target, you can pick it up at a local store or uh, or have it shipped. Correct. They have this option here, which is you can pick it up. So if I go back to the Walmart, and Walmart has changed since this this particular thing was done, but, but they say we'll basically put it in a box and we'll mail it to you. You'll get it in two days. Target's saying, yeah, we'll, we'll ship it to you in two days, but we've also only got three left. This is a term called BOPUS, buy online, pick up in store. Um, and so for sure, one of the things that we're going to want to be able to do is, is to be able to have that that particular product available. Melissa just said better images on Target, and I agree with that as well. It's like some, some of the images were quality. The big thing I wanted to do here, though, is, is definitely highlight the ability to pick up online. I, I'm, going to, I'm going to switch this to, to uh, something that I think will be interesting for f- folks to see which is BOPUS is continuing to grow. And I'm going to let, uh, we, we did a podcast probably several months ago with Dr. Bill Hargrave. He's kind of the industry leader with online buy up and uh, buy online, pick up and store. Uh, he was at the University of Arkansas. Then he was at Auburn. He's now the president of the University of Memphis, but very much a retail expert. He's going to talk a little bit about what some of the research is that he's per- personally done in the buy online, pick up and store area. Pre-pandemic, you know, retailers yeah. kind of looked at both as kind of as a nice to have. Like, yeah, I mean, you will offer it as a consumers. For the pandemic, it became a lifeline for a lot of retailers, and many retailers were absolutely not prepared for that. Uh, what I would do is, knowing that um, that we had um, that they were they were executed poorly. I would get, here's how I would, here's why I do it after I started realizing this is really bad. So I would go into the store and I'd, I would have my mobile device. I'd make sure I wasn't on the Wi Fi. I wasn't using their app. So they didn't know who I was and they didn't know I was in the store. Right. And I would literally stand in front of a shelf looking at the product and go online and say, I'd like to buy this and pick it up in store. And I'm standing there looking at the product. And, 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 I, and so I'll share with you some of the things that I got. For example, in apparel, I'm standing here, I'm looking at, there's five on the shelf. On my mobile device, it says, sorry, this product's unavailable at this location. I'm looking at, there's four on the shelf. Online, it says there's one left. Another another apparel item, There's th- I'm looking at, there's three of them on the shelf. Online, it says it's out of stock. What? Another one, I'm looking at, it. there's nine on the shelf, it doesn't even appear on their website. So, Mike, that that I just want to share with you. That's just a cut. That's just a handful, and that I've got I've got tons of these where it's like this is this is such poor execution that that you're that you're leaving money or the retailers are leaving money on the table. It's it's a combination of factors. Uh, the biggest one I believe is that they simply don't know what they have in the store. Mm. And they just don't have any confidence in what they have in the store. So when they don't, when you don't have confidence, you do a couple of things. One, either you just completely hide it, 
right? And so you just say, oh, this is not available, right? Or you don't even put it on the website to, to even make it an option. All right, we got a couple of questions in here. Um, the first question I think was, oh, I'm sorry, what a question was, Melissa was answering the question around uh, the better images of the target. Sorry about that. Uh, well, I think we've already answered that one. All right, so, all right, so customers ultimately are the boss. They're going to get the product when they want. Uh, retailers are becoming more fulfillment centers in terms of buy online, pick up a store and be able to do, do things like that. So what are the causes of product not being unavailable? And there seems to be about three is the research I've done. Number one, store operations. Number two, the supply chain. And number three, something that we're going to call on hand accuracy. And we've got some potential solutions for each one of those. Let's do, talk through store operations first. And, and Matt, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you some questions on this. So we've got a shelf here. I went to take a to, to a local store, took a picture of a shelf, and then I matched the shelf up to get what should have been there. So from an obvious casual observer, from a customer perspective, as you go into this, do you see anything majorly wrong or any kind of on-shelf availability issues with the shelf? Yeah, sure. There's one one item, obviously, out of stock, dead center. Dead center. Yep. So that's there's, that's the first one you see. That's the one most people will go to. Um, so you, you see the shelf tag, you see no product. You obviously say there's an auto stock. Any other thing, things that jump out you as issues that are with this? Yeah. I mean, it looks like another auto stock on the very bottom shelf dead center, but that's all that's easy to see. Yeah. And that one, that one is potentially an auto stock as well. Yeah. Uh, what you don't see is probably the bigger issues. You have issues where you literally have a label that's missing. And so suppliers call this di di distribution void a supply uh, well, retailers typically call you call this modular integrity issues but let's just say on the top three shelves here you see that yellow box we're supposed to have label one two th three and what we've got is one two four okay we're missing label three so that yellow box indicates the label's missing and of course if the label's missing the product's also missing the other issue we have is we have pricing issues we have issues where the price at the register and the price at the uh, point of sale are, uh, I'm sorry, register and the shelf are different. And hopefully the price at the register is not more expensive than the point of sale because then people start to lose, you know, integrity with, with, uh, with the pricing situation. Um, the next one is downstocking. There's products up here on the top that could come down. As a matter of fact, this red box right here where we have the out of stock could be sitting up atop, but it should be down stock because the top's not really available for sale. Uh, and the last one is the one is really hard to do, which is plugged items. Plugged items or otherwise called incorrect items was where you have a label, you have product, but they are, and in fact, not the same. They're different. Okay. So Mike is asking, what are the thoughts on one increasing the level of retail theft on OSA as per LinkedIn post from Tony? Uh, Mike, I, I think we're going to get into the on-hand accuracy piece here in a little bit. Uh, I believe that the retail shrink is part of the problem of why on-hand on accuracy becomes incorrect, and we'll talk about that here in, in just a little bit. Okay? Um, if I don't, come on back to me. Um, thanks. So uh, let's keep on going here. So so we've also got supply chain issues. That's another one. Um, and we've obviously got everything from Products moving on, uh, you know, raw material through the manufacturing and distribution process. Well, the reality is in order for the product to move one way, the merchandise flow from the raw material all the way to the store shelves to the shopper, information has to move back the other way. And we're going to talk a little bit about the challenge of correct item information, correct on-hand information at a store level. But I would argue that this quality information is is really a challenge within the entire supply chain. So if you're getting really bad forecasting data or really bad uh, on-hand data, et cetera, it's really hard to make sure the product is in the supply chain. And we certainly exhibited that during the, the COVID challenge where we had things, everything so tight from a just-in-time standpoint that a major things like a, a, a health scare like that really created ripples in the supply chain for months and even years to come. And the last one is the on-hand accuracy. And, and Mike, we'll jump back into this in a second. But these are four specific genes uh, in a retailer. I've got a store on hand, an actual on hand, whether it's accurate or not. And the reorder point is for, for those of you in the supply chain is really says when it comes down to hitting 
the number and the reorder point, I'm going to kick off another order to get some more product. Well, the first two, the first one is obviously right. Not a problem with that one. The next one, next one is what we call understated. You're understating what you have. You think you have three and you really have four. Probably not a major issue unless you think you have three and you really have 400 or something like that. But the last two are the real issues, which is where you have a store on hand that says I have three and I don't have any at all in this last example. Matt, if I don't have any, I obviously don't sell any. And if I don't sell any, how many do you think I should order if I ha- if I don't have any product, Matt? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I slipped away there for a second. Go ahead and answer that. Okay. So if, if I don't have any product, this is the last product in the store. If I don't have any, how many should I order? Well, three, right? Yeah, could be three. The problem is... The on hand of store on hand is three. It thinks I have three, but I don't have any. Reorder point is two. So it says when your system goes down to an on hand of two, go ahead and reorder three, right? But your on hand is actually zero. So you're never going to loop. You're never going to remove unless somebody changes it or unless a system changes it or unless somebody sells one, which you're not going to sell because you don't have any. Your on hand is always going to be three and nobody's going to change that. So you're never going to order that product. So inventory accuracy in retail outside of this RFID thing that we'll talk about in a little bit is still in the 50s and 60s. In some cases, that's probably okay. But uh, in other cases, high velocity items where you have a lot of holding power and a lot of velocity at the shelf, 50 and 60% is okay. Other categories that are very, very important to customers, you may only have one or two on the shelf. So if you're off by 50%, you're probably going to not meet their expectations. Um, so let's keep, let's keep going through this. Um, one of the other things, and this was a a study that was done a little bit before COVID 2019 by, you know, folks with Mike Price over there in Europe and the ECR community over in Europe. But I thought this, I think I've showed this to a few people and this has been like interesting to them. And I think I want to make sure I highlight it. Green dots you have here basically is the orders or the on hand that you actually have available in the store. And the green solid line is what the actual on hand of the system is. So it's the green line and said, in other words, is what the system thinks you have. The dots are what you actually have. And as you see, there's a difference between what you have and what you think. And we add that in with the lead time, you end up with a second scenario over here where you didn't order it enough time to get it on the shelf and it ended up becoming an out of stock. That's one of the downsides, even if it's not a phantom inventory where it's a zero situation. It's definitely a problem for the for the for that particular replenishment item. Well, I hope you enjoyed part one of my state of the industry comments on on shelf availability. Please join me next time as we wrap up this discussion and talk a little bit about some real life examples in the space of RFID and other technologies to drive on shelf availability. See you then.